the okay, fact that you put us live on YouTube and then I will put it start our webinar. So now we get to start our awkward silence. <laughs> I'm going to start our webinar now, and then I will let you know as soon as we are live on HHTV for, and that we can begin. All right, we are now live on HHTV. You may begin. Good evening. Uh, on behalf of the Arts Lecture Committee and the Diversity Awareness Committee, I want, I'm, my name is Pam Mitchell, and I want to welcome all of you to our uh, uh, web version of the uh, lecture for Thursday, uh, the 13th of um, January. We had intended to be quote, live in Anderson Hall, and then thought better of cramming all of us in there uh, with the rising number of, of uh, cases. And <laughs> I'm hearing uh, an echo from the living room where my husband is watching this. Okay, so at any rate, uh, welcome and thank you for your persistence and perseverance in making this pivot from uh, an in-person performance to the, um, uh, the webinar. Uh, the Arts Lecture Committee, uh, the Arts Lectures Committee has a, uh, a session once a month. This is our January session, but for a variety of reasons, we're in a different time than usual. And we are so thankful to the Diversity Awareness Committee for giving their time slot over to this and we're jointly sponsoring this. Let me turn it briefly to Sally Wren, from, who chairs the Diversity Awareness Committee, for a brief comment about that committee. Sally? Thank you, Pam. I just wanted to welcome everybody on behalf of the uh, Diversity Awareness Committee and say how, a, how special it is to have a program chasing me to my grave um, and having Erin Kelly in from Tufts University and to present this because it addresses the arts and it also addresses diversity and the Jim Crow uh, situation. So thank you and thank you all for attending tonight, whether uh, in Zoom, video, and it will be replayed. Pam will have the information. Thank you, Pam. Thank you, Sally. Yes, we uh, uh, because this was rather rapidly shifted over, to um, uh, virtual rather than in person. We are replaying it on uh, Sunday evening at 7.30 on HHTV and also Wednesday evening at 7.30 on HHTV. And then it will be archived uh, on, the, um, um, on the Horizon House webpage so that if you miss, if those two times are not convenient, you can watch it through the archive. Well, it is absolutely my pleasure to welcome Erin King, who is a professor of philosophy at Tufts University in Boston. She is also the daughter of Ann Kelly, I'm sorry, not Erin King, Erin Kelly, 
who is professor of philosophy at Tufts University. And she's also the daughter of Ann Kelly, who is the chair of our arts committee. So she was going to be in town this week and we are just delighted to have her joining us to make this presentation. Shut the door, please. Um, Aaron, Aaron grew up in Rochester, Minnesota, um, and then went on to graduate. Uh, she did her undergraduate work in philosophy at Stanford, and then went to Columbia University for graduate study. She then went to Harvard, where she earned her PhD with her research interest in moral and political philosophy, ethics, and criminal law. She has an extensive bibliography of publications, but the one that she's gonna be talking about tonight is the one about Wilfred, uh, Wilfred Rempert. And we will hear more from Aaron uh, about how that came to be and the art and his work as he told it to her. Aaron? Thank you so much for having me. I'm really looking forward to talking about the book and I appreciate your interest in the book. Writing the book was a great pleasure and honor for me and to be able to share it with others. Um, in Horizon House, where my mom has enjoyed the community and told me so much about it um, is something I'm, I'm very happy to do. So I am going to give you a flavor of the book, talk about the different um, themes in the book and tell you about Winfred Rembert. And I'm going to start, um, let's see, by sharing my screen because I'd like to show you some slides. Uh, view full screen. Okay, so this is the book that I'm talking about tonight with you, Chasing Me to My Grave, um, an artist's memoir of the Jim Crow South um, written by Winfred Rembert, and I was the collaborating writer for the book. It's a memoir, as you can see, of Winfred's life growing up in the Jim Crow South. Um, he was born in 1945 and lived until um, March last year, March 2021. Unfortunately, he passed away before the book was published, um, although he had reviewed the entire book and I'll tell you a little bit more about our process, but he was happy about the book. He had seen the, the final advanced review copy, but unfortunately was not here for the publication of the book. And I'm sure he would love to be here talking with you about the book. He so much loved talking about his experiences and he was, was very eager to share them with other people. So um, let me now show you a picture of Winfred. This is Winfred. Um, and the book is told from his perspective and in his voice based on my interviews with him over a period of about two years, starting in March, 2018 through March, 2020. And then we spent a number of months after that, um, just fine tuning the book and preparing it for publication. Most of the interviews in were done in his home for the for, during the period of the first two years until the pandemic shut us down and we weren't able to um, meet in person anymore. Um, so the final uh, bit of the project we did over the phone, but the bulk of the interviews were done. Um, so what I'd like to do, and I'll tell you a little bit more about our process, but what I'd like to do first is to give you a feel for his voice um, by reading a little bit from the book. Um, from the beginning. Um, so this is going to be an excerpt from the first chapter of the book. And uh, the, the chapter is called Walking to My Mother. The railroad goes so far, just as far as you can see. It ain't got a crook in it. Those tracks go from Cuthbert up through Dawson and straight on up to Leslie. They start big and they get smaller and smaller the farther away they go. I wanna paint a picture of those railroad tracks. I want to get that right. I'm definitely going to do that picture about me walking along that lonely railroad by myself, trying to get away from the police. I was 16 or 17 years old. I can't remember exactly what the police were after me for. I got to really go back and get in my mind what they were chasing me for but I know they were chasing me. I was living by myself in mama's house at that time. She was living in Connecticut 
with her son, JT. Mama was the woman that was raising me. She wasn't my birth mother. Her name was Lillian, Lillian Rembert, and I called her Mama. She was my mother's aunt, my great aunt. Mama was a slim woman, straight up and down. She wore long dresses and short jackets. Her shoes had, had block high heels, not the ones that skinny, and her dresses hung all the way down to her shoes. Mama's hair was fixed into a ball. She was a brown skinned woman with nice looking hair, but she pulled her hair back into a ball and pinned hair pieces on. The mailman brought those hair pieces and I remember watching her put them on. Back then I always stayed alert. I was doing a lot of crazy things and running away from the cops. Mama thought I was going to get killed. Things were just going all crazy and I didn't have a clear view of what was happening around me. Even when I was asleep, if I heard the least little noise, I'd wake up to see what it is. It was early in the morning before daylight. I heard car doors shutting and I struggled to peep out of the window. I couldn't see a whole lot, but I could see enough to tell that it was an official's car with the sheriff's sign on the side of it. They kicked the door in and were calling my name. Winfred, Winfred, where are you boy? Like I was going to answer them. I thought that was funny. I don't know what made them think I was going to answer. I knew I couldn't laugh out loud, but deep down inside, I was laughing, even though I was also scared. I couldn't run out of the house because they were right there. I looked at the hole in the mattress. When mama would make up the bed, she would stick her hand in that hole and fluff up the mattress. I put my arm in that hole and when I did that, I tore the mattress. So I jumped inside that cotton, dug in and pulled the cover all the way over. I was inside that tick mattress. The police were walking around with their flashlights shining. There was no power since I was living there by myself and I didn't care nothing about no electricity. There were no lights on and that saved me. As soon as the police left the house, I ran down through the woods to the railroad a half mile away. I figured no one was looking for me there. I ran down the hill to the railroad fast. When I got there, I stopped and I looked all the way down it. My idea was to find my mother, my real true birth mother, Nancy Mae Johnson. I didn't have no money, no nothing, nobody else to turn to and say, I'm in trouble, I need your help. All my resources were worn out. My mother lived in Leslie and I was going to walk that railroad until I found her. <clears throat> I never tried to paint that journey looking for my mother, but I've always pictured it in my mind not just every now and then, but frequently in my life as I go along from day to day. I didn't want to touch it until I felt like I could really do a good job. I want that railroad to be just like it was when I stepped on it and looked down it. For some reason, even now, I never thought that I could get it right. I don't know if I could sit down and put it together like it really was. I want to do it on paper first. If I draw on a sheet of paper the actual size of the painting, I could try to get it exactly right before I put it on leather. I may, have to, I may have to do five or six drawings before I pick the right one for the final cut. I don't think I could sit down and go from beginning to end like that, but I think I could start. All right, so that's an excerpt from chapter one. Winfred did paint the painting that he was describing in the first chapter of the book, which was a great accomplishment um, during the period of time that he was working on the book with me. And I'll come back to that um, in, a, in, a in a few minutes. Um, the theme of his search for his mother is one of the themes of the book. Um, and it was a, a very interesting um, theme to hear him think about and talk about as he recited other important events in his life and would return to um, the importance of reflecting on his family and in particular his mother and the pain of her having relinquished him when he was a child um, and wanting somehow to earn her love or to discover it. Um, now, what I've shown you, the pictures that I've shown you are all paintings on leather. Um, they are, let me show you an example of a sheet of leather that Winfred uses as the basis of his paintings. So he, he takes a 
just like a cowhide, you know, piece of leather that you might make um, leather goods out of like a purse or something like that. He buys a big sheet of leather and he, he carves on the leather with a knife and different tooling instruments to give it texture. Um, and then he dyes it. So he uses all kinds of different tools. If you look at this, you can see, you know, the different li lines and the, and the dots and all of the detail are scratched into the leather using different tools um, to, to shape it and give it texture and to create the scene that he wants to paint. Um, and then, as I, as I just mentioned, the, the painting is done with dye that's like shoe dye, um, and it creates um, very vi vibrant, bright colors, um, which Winfred loved. He, uh, most of his paintings, as you'll see, are very, very colorful. Um, so here's the painting that you just saw carved on leather, now having been dyed. Um, this is called All Me. It's a painting of prisoners coming from Winfred's own experience of having been incarcerated um, in Georgia for seven years. Um, and he spent most of those seven years on chain gangs, which were incredibly brutal forms of punishment that were used in Georgia at the time and had been throughout the early 20th century. Um, they did a lot of very difficult work um, digging ditches, cracking rocks um, all day long, 24, 7, 12 months a year under all kinds of difficult conditions, um, all kinds of weather. And this uh, theme of prisoners reflecting on his own life experience was one of the artistic themes that he pursued. And this was the first painting that I ever saw of Winfred's work. I came across it by chance online. Um, I was writing a book about criminal justice and I became very interested in this painting about prisoners and was curious about the story behind the, the, the painting. I wanted to know more about the artist and about, um, about why he was painting prisoners. Um, and I read about him uh, and watched a documentary about him and uh, found that he lived in New Haven, Connecticut, um, which isn't far from where I live in Boston. And I happened to be um, driving from New York to Boston on a certain, uh, on a certain day and, um, and knew that I would be doing that and arranged to stop in New Haven to, to visit him. And I asked him if I could uh, interview him about his experience. I told him I was writing a book about criminal justice and I would be very interested in his own thoughts about the criminal justice system. Um, and we, we talked a bit about this painting um, and about his experience in the criminal justice system. Um, and he had a lot of interesting things to say. Um, about this painting, um, I'll share with you a few thoughts that, um, that are developed in the book um, that he, um, that, that to give you a sense of his perspective on this painting and, and the meaning of it. So as I said, it was called, it's called All Me. And he explained that the, the chain gang was so difficult that he had to be more than one person in, in himself in order to survive um, what was happening there, to sur survive some of the brutality um, and the, the inhumanity of this form of incarceration and punishment that, um, that he was going through. Um, so what sort of one expression of the painting, I think is, um, is about, or one kind of aspect of the meaning of the painting is the strength that it took for him to survive, um, that he had to be bigger than himself. He had to be, be more than one person. Um, I think, the uh, fragmentation of one person into many um, also gives expression to the psychological trauma that his experience on the chain gang um, unfortunately inflicted on him. So um, there were times when his sense of sanity was really challenged by the abuse that he was undergoing um, on these chain gangs. Um, not only was the work terrible, but any kind of resistance or um, 
insubordination or the appearance of that or the sense of not working hard enough could land you in um, the sweat box, which was a form of torture used um, to break the prisoners down psychologically. Um, they were forced to stand in a um, small wooden box that wasn't high enough to completely stand up in, but also was uh, not big enough to sit down in. Um, and it was hot in the, in, in the summer, it was cold in the winter, and they were forced to stand there for um, sometimes three or four days at a time. And Winford talks about the psychological challenge of this and the importance to him of finding a way to resist what was happening in order to keep his sanity, which he did by refusing to eat and drink and to gain some sense of control over what his own experience was in that sweat box. So I think this painting also gives expression to that sense of psychological fragility, the, the threat to one's sanity, the, um, the kind of fragmentation, psychological fragmentation, um, which can be, we might connect with the, with the trauma that he suffered. Um, he also said that he had to take on a lot of different roles um, in prison in order to survive. And he didn't wanna be any of those people. He didn't wanna be tough and fight other prisoners and, um, and um, act like you know, uh, somebody who was willing to do violence to others um, in order to defend himself. Um, but he, he had to be someone he didn't want to be any of these people he was forced to be in order to survive. So he decided to be all of them. So there's another layer of kind of all me um, as uh, represented in, in this painting. And I think finally it conveys in maybe a, a strange way, a sense of community um, that his own experience was um, not, not only his own experience is represented in this painting, but all of the other, other prisoners as well. Um, and uh, it was uh, an important, uh, 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 one of Winfred's dreams for the book and his sense of the importance of writing the book was that it would give expression to the experience of other people who had been through the kind of mistreatment that he was forced to endure in Georgia um, between 1945 and 1974 when he was released from prison. He was in prison from 1967 until 19. 74 and actually in jail two years before he was sentenced to the chain gang. So a total of about 10 years. Um, so this sense of being um, wanting to tell a story about what people had been through, not just himself, but other people was a sort of big theme and, and motivator, a motivator for the book. Um, so Winfred told me about his experience in prison. We talked about the painting um, we talked a little bit about his life in Georgia. I found him fascinating. He was a very open, very articulate, interesting person who was eager to talk about his life experience and could do it in a thoughtful um, and serious way. And he told me um, that he was interested in writing his life story as a book and that he hadn't had the opportunity to do that. He'd been telling his life story through his paintings for years. Um, and had done quite a bit of public speaking, but hadn't written his full story as a book in the way that he wanted to get it done. Um, and I had stayed in touch with him. And when I finished the project that I was working on, um, I, I went to visit him and, um, and, and told him that it, if, you know, I would be willing to work with him if he, if he wanted my help in writing the book and we could try out the relationship and see how it goes and see whether he was um, pleased with the work that I was doing and you know what the book would become. So we started working together. Um, and as I mentioned before, I'd go to his house in New Haven and uh, we would have these conversations um, about his life, starting actually with the conversation about searching for his mother, which became the first chapter of the book. That was my first meeting with him. Um, which was very, very moving, I thought, and very, very deep to hear him talk about these personal themes. Um, and I would, after speaking with him for a couple of hours, go home, I would write up the interview as pages for the book, um, selecting parts of them that I thought would work. And then I would go back to New Haven and read the pages back to him. 
and he would fill out the story. We would talk um, about whether there were missing pieces that um, should be filled in. And he would sometimes, his memory would be jogged and he would um, think about more things that he wanted to tell me. Um, and we proceeded that way um, with a lot of reading out loud and the pages began to accumulate and the book unfolded. So, um, so that was our process. It was a very collaborative process. It was a very exploratory process because I didn't know where the, uh, where the story exactly was leading and where it would end up. Um, so there were a lot of interesting um, discoveries for me about, about him and about um, the process of writing a book like this. Um, so after the conversation we had about his search for his mother and his mother's love, um, we returned to his childhood and he talked um, more about um, his early life. He lived um, outside of Cuthbert, Georgia, which is in Southwest Georgia, it's a very small town in Southwest Georgia. And he was living on a cotton plantation um, with his great aunt in a little house. They were tenant farmers on this um, large cotton plantation um, where they worked in the fields. Um, and Winfred was taken out to the fields with his, uh, with his great aunt, whom he called Mama. And you can see in this painting that he's there on her cotton sack. Um, it's, he's the small boy sitting on the cotton sack in the center bottom of the painting. Um, so he says some of his first memories um, were of the cotton fields. In fact, he opened his eyes to cotton. That was his first um, visual memory was this field of <clears throat> white cotton, like a sheet stretching out. Um, and there was something beautiful about it, although it didn't feel beautiful for very long. He said, once you're out there working in it. Here he was, of course, too young um, to work, but he was pulled along by his um, mama as she was uh, picking cotton um, and uh, spent the day in the fields with her. Here's another scene from the cotton fields when Winfred's wife, Patsy, who's also from rural Georgia, saw this painting, um, she fell in love with it. Um, and she said, she told me this was her favorite painting because it captured a scene that was so familiar in her life as well. Uh, so is this just a scene of the field workers um, having lunch next to the field? Actually, it's called dinner time in the cotton field. Um, and Patsy said that could have been out of her life as well. A lot of people, um, a lot of black Americans in that part of the South spent time picking cotton. He painted a lot of different versions of these cotton field paintings, um, many of them just using these incredibly vibrant colors. Um, they have a, a sense of abstraction, um, but they're about something very personal and memorable and difficult, um, this experience of working in the cotton fields. Um, <clears throat> another example of Kind of his sense of of musicality and um, and rhythm and almost playfulness, which is remarkable considering the the difficulty of the experiences that he's representing here in this kind of beautiful way, inviting anyone to come and learn about um, about life in the South um, and to contemplate and think about the stories behind behind these paintings. This painting is called From Caint to Caint. You can't see when you get into the field and you can't see when you leave. It's dark. That's a long day, he said. From Caint to Caint. Winfred said that women worked in the cotton fields sometimes um, while they were pregnant. In fact, um, this is a painting of a woman who actually had her baby in the cotton field while she was working. And he said that she went back to work um, after giving birth to the baby right then and there because she was afraid of what the white man would think about her if she stopped working. It's just sort of mind, mind boggling um, what people went through um, and the, the, the suffering that they felt that they had to endure. Uh, 
in order to to do the work that was um, required of them. Winfred was taken out of school in order to uh, work in the fields. He didn't go to school much. Um, he said a couple times a week, sometimes he would make it to school, um, but most of the time he didn't. He was working in the cotton fields um, together with other families. This is a painting of the schoolroom that he, um, that was his schoolroom when he was able to attend school. Um, and he, he's the figure at the stove feeding uh, the wood stove with wood. And the reason was that he was so far behind, he had no idea what was going on. He couldn't read um, or write. And in order to not, so as not to hu have him feel humiliated um, by his um, lack of ability, um, lack of, of, of knowledge, the teacher gave him a task. Uh, she, he, could, he could feed the, the stove with wood. So that's what he did. Um, and he was so grateful to this woman um, for her sensitivity to him. And she did try to teach him to read. Um, here's a picture of Miss Prather's teacher um, teaching kids to, to read. I think that's Winfred. Um, he didn't learn then, but he did learn um, later. In fact, he learned how to read when he was in prison. Some other prisoners taught him how to read. Um, it was a very significant uh, development for him in his life. And I just wanted to read a couple of sentences about his learning to read when he was in, in prison um, and uh, how important this was to him. He said, I think your mind is just waiting to learn. Your mind wants you to pick up a book and read it. Once I learned how I began to read all the time, I didn't have any idea it would be like that. I knew I wanted to learn, but I didn't know my mind would open up to wanting to read more and more. Um, I think that's that's just beautiful. Um, and um, once once he was more educated, as he suggests, his his mind opened up. He um, he and other prisoners um, found magazines by the side of the road. They would read them uh, in the prison camp in order to. Uh, have some sense of what was going on in the outside world. Um, and this was very, very important. Winfred's mama, um, who, with whom he'd been living out on the plantation, eventually was able to move into town. Her son uh, built her a house and she and Winfred moved into Cuthbert, Georgia. Um, she was still working in the cotton fields and took Winfred with her. Um, it was so miserable, he decided he was not going to do it anymore, and he ran away from home. Um, he ran down to Hamilton Avenue, um, it, which is the Black neighborhood in Cuthbert, Georgia, and this is a painting of Hamilton Avenue. Um, and when Winford got there, he discovered this Black community um, of people doing all kinds of interesting things. He didn't know Black folks had businesses. There were juke joints, there were pool halls, there were shops, um, and he began to meet people and to discover life outside the cotton field. And it was a very joyous um, eventuality for him. Um, he began to visit the pool halls and juke joints. Here's one of the establishments where people would dance, they would eat, they would play pool. Um, Winfred met people, and um, this was just electrifying for him. And I think you get some sense of that just from the um, how vibrant the painting is and um, how joyous the dancing is. This is a painting called the Dirty Spoon Cafe, um, which was actually purchased by the High Museum in Atlanta. It's currently in the High Museum. Um, I'll read you just a couple of sentences about the Dirty Spoon Cafe, which was one of Winford's favorites. He said, the Dirty Spoon Cafe was a juke joint for adults. They wouldn't let kids in there. I guess they kept more rules and regulations than, than anybody else. I would look in the window though, to see all the people in their fancy dress. The best dressed person was a man called Egg. Egg was an excellent dancer. He was disabled, but he could dance. He used to swing those girls and I was standing there in the window looking at him do it. I learned how to swing dance watching Egg through the window. 
I wanted to dance like, like him. I already knew the chicken and the jitterbug and the slop. I had those down pat, but I never learned how to swing a girl like Egg did. He was swinging those girls and he could spin and be on time, catch them and pick them up. It was just a great thing to watch. So that's the dirty spoon. Winfred also met other kids and here's a swimming hole where they um, would, would go sometimes spend the, spend the day, swim, fish. Um, and all this was a source of, of, great, of great joy to Winfred. He got a job in Jeff's cafe where he, um, he worked in the pool room and um, collected the balls and, and racked them up and, um, and managed, you know, helped Jeff to run, to run the pool room. And it was here that Winfred began to develop a political consciousness. Um, this was the early 60s and the civil rights movement had begun um, to reach this part of Georgia a student non-violent non um, uh, uh, SNCC, student non-violating, non-violent coordinating committee came to um, teach people about the civil rights movement and how to demonstrate and, um, and uh, to, say, to utilize the method of non-violence um, as a form of political protest. And um, Winford began to learn about what was going on in the civil rights movement. Um, in Georgia, they talked about Albany. Uh, they talked about America's Georgia, which was not far away um, from Cuthbert. And Winford decided to get involved in the civil rights movement um, and to attend some of the protests. Um, America's was, um, Winford said, a, a very tough, um, a tough place to demonstrate. Um, he said, and this is just a couple sentences from the book about America's, they had this terrible sheriff named Fred Chapel. He was a mean monster. He was above the law. He was the law. Um, Sam Mahone was a high school student at the time. One day when he was 17 years old, he took 10 people down to the courthouse. Sam was standing across the hallway from the registrar's office, waiting until each person had, had a chance to register when Sheriff Chapel attacked him from behind. I didn't hear him coming or anything. He knocked me down literally with a fist to the back of my neck. I immediately curled into a fetal position as we were trained to do to protect our most vulnerable parts, like our head and our midsection, and he commenced kicking me. People who witnessed what the sheriff did would go back and tell others what had happened. Some people who were standing in line even left the courthouse without registering. As Sam tells it, there was intimidation from the moment you walked into the courthouse, not just from the sheriff but all the whites who held office there, they were just menacing people who came in there. They did not want black people to vote. So this was a very difficult situation to get involved in as a political protester. Um, Winfred decided to take the risk. He joined the movement. He went to Americas where he participated in a couple of demonstrations. Um, one of the demonstrations turned violent um, and Winfred had to flee. Um, the, the violence and um, was being chased by a couple of men with shotguns. Um, he saw a car with the keys in it. He stole the car and drove back to Cuthbert in order to escape and was later arrested in Cuthbert. And this is the, what, this was his entrance into the criminal justice system um, and what led him down, down the path to the chain gang. Um, he was put in jail for uh, about over a year, almost two years, no charges. Um, he got frustrated. He plugged the John in his cell and flooded it. And the deputy sheriff came back to the cell and um, began to beat him up. There was a struggle and Winfred ended up um, uh, taking the deputy's gun away from him and locking him in the cell and escaping. Um, this was, of course, a very fateful um, day. He was later um, rearrested and um, taken by an angry mob out to the woods where he was nearly lynched, um, brought back to Cuthbert, put in jail again, and um, ended up on the chain gang for those seven years I was, I was telling you about. These are some more pictures of the chain gang, the kind of work that they were doing 
which Winfred um, presents in this incredibly artistic way. An interesting ha thing happened to him when he was in prison. He uh, got to know this prisoner who was tooling leather in his cell. His name was TJ the Tooler, at least that's what Winfred called him. And Winfred was interested in learning about this craft and TJ taught him how to tool leather. They would make little bill folds and wallets and purses and sometimes sell them to people that visited the prison. Um, but this was the beginning, unbeknownst to Winfred at the time, of what would become the medium of his artwork and um, was the moment at which he began to develop these skills that became so important for his artwork at a later time. Another interesting, very fortunate thing happened to Winfred when he was in prison, which was that he met his uh, future wife, Patsy, who I mentioned a few minutes ago. He was working by the side of the road and he, um, he met Patsy and later um, discovered where she lived because he was building a bridge near her house. Um, and this was, this is what Winfred looked like in at least his imagination at the time he met Patsy. Um, and here's Patsy's yard where Winfred saw her um, washing on an old fashioned rub board um, and surrounded by her family. And he, um, he asked the he asked the family if he could have a, a glass of water. He was working on the road, and um, they obliged. And he and Patsy were looking at each other, um, and that was the beginning of what became a beautiful love story. She waited for him for years. I think it was four years that she waited for him um, until he was released from prison. They wrote many letters back and forth, um, some very moving, intimate letters. A couple of them are published in the book. Um, and Patsy would visit him in the, in the chain gang, you know, prison camp. Um, and eventually, um, he was to his surprise released after seven years, um, even though he had been sentenced by the judge in Cuthbert to 27 years. This is a picture of Winford and Patsy, um, just after he was released from prison and before they got married. Um, they got married shortly after he was uh, released from prison, just a few months later, and they're standing on the road outside of um, Patsy's house uh, um, just before their wedding, their wedding day. Um, Patsy was instrumental in Winfred becoming an artist. He would tell these stories about people that he remembered from Cuthbert, Georgia, people who were kind to him, people who helped him when he was a boy, the different colorful figures, um, such as the one that I mentioned to you a few minutes ago in the juke joints and pool halls. And Patsy felt that Winfred's life experience and personal stories were important, that they should be part of a record, there should be a record of these stories. And she um, got the idea that he could tell these stories on, on leather. He could um, use his leather tooling skills, not just to make purses and wallets, but works of art and works of art that would, that would tell his life story. Um, and so he decided to try it, to follow her advice. Um, and he began to, um, to, to tool and carve, uh, beginning with some of the themes that I've shared with you already, the cotton fields, um, the juke joints, people that he knew in Cuthbert. Um, and then over time began to um, tell some of the more traumatic aspects of um, his life story, including the near lynching that I, I mentioned to you earlier and, um, and the, some of the suffering in, in prison that he, that he underwent. Um, this was, a very difficult process for him. Uh, sometimes creating these paintings um, would, would bring the trauma up and he would have trouble sleeping at night. Um, he said that he would wake up in the middle of the night after having nightmares that he was being chased by the police for things that he did or for the things that they thought he had done. 
Um, and he said that, uh, and, he, and he would literally wake up fighting. Um, and sometimes he'd fall out of bed. He was fighting so hard. Um, so he was obviously suffering from some trauma and the artwork was a way both to kind of work out the trauma and give expression to it, but also uh, was something that that stirred it up. And the reason we decided to, oh, I was going to tell you about this. This is one of the paintings that he did um, about a lynching. There was a, a, a three panel work that he did, um, a triptych, um, about a lynching that was purchased, that the, the triptych was purchased by Yale University, um, uh, who gave him his first kind of big art show after having discovered him in New Haven. Um, and this is the third panel of the triptych um, where the bodies are, are buried in, in graves. And he added an extra grave because he said, you might as well bury humanity as well. Um, so these, <laughs> Obviously, the, the subject is, of his work is very serious um, and, and difficult and very, very personal. And we decided to call the book Chasing Me to My Grave as um, a reference to these um, nightmares that he had um, that, uh, that reflected the experiences, his the experience of the Jim, Jim Crow South and, and its uh, psychological, the psychological scars that it, it left upon him. Patsy's love for Winford was an incredible support for him as a person and as an artist. Um, and their love story is a, a major theme in the book. It's, I think, very beautiful. Um, I would like to read just briefly um, his, a few of his thoughts about her. Um, from the last part of the book, and this will lead us back to the theme also of his mother that we that we opened with. Uh, okay, here are just a few a few sentences from the closing of the book. I've always wanted Patsy to know how much I care about her. It's just that I'm old now. I can't sing her the songs like I used to. We used to go fishing out in the river on a little boat I rented. While we were floating along fishing. She wanted me to sing songs to her. I'd say, Patsy, that'll run the fish away. But she didn't care. She wanted me to sing. So I sang every song I knew. And sometimes we'd sit on the rocks at the bank of the fish creek singing. Me and Patsy do a lot of talking about down home. That brings things back to me. Then I might do a sketch and I'll talk with Patsy about it to see if that's something I want to do. Patsy, Patsy always said I would do the railroad tracks and I wondered for a long time whether I should do it. My mind was all crazy about that picture. I wanted to do it for so long, 20 years and coming. I just kept putting it aside. I didn't do it. Do you know what I would do? I would get out my leather and get ready to draw it down and have some kind of conversation about it. And then I would throw it aside. I put other stuff ahead of it. I was really worried about the kind of picture it would turn out to be. The meaning of it is what had me worried. I knew that when I do that painting, I've got to confront my birth mother, Nancy, Nancy Mae Johnson. I've got to come face to face with me being her son. Here we go, me and her. I'm walking down the railroad tracks and I'm getting closer and closer. You know, when railroad tracks come to a crossing, they go every which way. When those railroad tracks start parting, one, two, three, I got to make up my mind which one of them is leading to Leslie, Georgia. Me and Directions got a good relationship. My directions have always been good. I kept going east, the way the morning sun is shining. So I'm painting those railroad tracks and all kinds of possibilities are going through my mind. The way things could have been, or the way my mother could have been thinking at the time she gave birth to me. And it changed my perspective about her. I had mercy on her a little bit. Mercy is when you forgive people for what they've done or for what you feel they've done. You say, well, I'm not going to hold that against them anymore. I'm just going to be lenient and go with it, like from the good side. Now that I've done the picture, I look at it and I think about stories. Me and Patsy sit down and talk about my mother. I think my mother had a way of showing her love. For a long time, I didn't understand it. But now I think she showed her love the best way she could by opening the door and letting me in.
that's not actually the last line of the book. I will leave that to you. Uh, but it was so moving and, and, and powerful, I thought, to see him work through his feelings about his mother through producing this work of art. And then for him to be able to share it was, I thought, astounding. Winfred and Patsy, and I'll leave you with this mm -hmm. picture of Winfred, um, who had a wicked sense of humor, as well as a very um, serious mind. All right, I will stop Aaron, there. Thank you so much. That, I have tears in my eyes. <laughs> that is just beautiful. Um, we have some time. Uh, and uh, so if people are on YouTube or on the, um, the Zoom webinar, uh, there's several ways you can ask questions. There's a chat box, and I will be keeping an eye on that. Uh, and then there's also at the bottom of the Zoom a Q&A where you can also type in a question, and John Pound's going to be our monitor for that. Um, so while we're waiting for people, Aaron, um, this is Pam. I have a a uh, question about, uh, did he ever have any formal art art experience? Uh, that, you know, I, I keep seeing Jacob Lawrence in those incredible colors. Uh, did he have any training in art formally? He did not. He did not. He was um, utterly self-taught. Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting that you make the compar comparison with Jacob Lawrence because the way I discovered Rembert was that I was Googling Jacob Lawrence paintings. <laughs> and um, one of Winfred's paintings popped up, the one that I showed you. So there's a resonance there for sure, yeah. but it's not through his education um, in any formal way about art. He had some very close friends um, in Hamden, Connecticut, which is right next to New Haven, Bill and Sharon McLean, and they um, own an antiquarian bookshop um, and in the bookshop, they had a number of books about artists. And when Winters, Winfred was interested in, you know, trying his luck and skill as an artist, he asked to look at some of the books um, and, you know, thumb through them. And that apparently, I don't see anything there that I couldn't do. Um, <laughs> and decided to make a painting to give his friend Phil, Phil McLean for, for Christmas that year. And that was the beginning of it. Um, so that was pretty much it, looking at some art books um, to get a sense of what other artists had done was something that he did only in a very cursory way. But he didn't have any, any formal education in, in art or in college or in high school. This is John with a follow-up question to that. Did you have the opportunity to see him do any of his uh, paintings? I did. I asked him to demonstrate because, of course, I wanted to write about it and I wanted to include some descriptions of his art making in the book. Um, so I asked him to, to, you know, work on one of the pieces that he was working on and to talk about what he was doing. Um, and so he spread this kind of sheet of leather out on a desk in a studio and spray it with water to kind of make it more supple. And then he would carve it with these different tools. And he was incredibly skilled. Like he could just create, you know, a face and shape it and, um, and give it expression in, you know, just like so seemingly easily. Um, and sometimes he would start kind of at one corner and he would just begin to fill it in and mm -hmm. go across the canvas. Um, I mean, that took longer than, than what I was able to witness, but I did see him working on his, his canvases and using the tools, um, and he talked about um, the process and the, the pleasure he took in the process. Um, I think Sally has a question, but you'll have to unmute, Sally. I wanted to know what size his paintings were. Were they large or various? They were, they're various. You can't really get a sense from the book really of how large some of these pieces are. Um, some of them are 
probably, you know, three feet by four, four and a half feet. Um, he'd go to the leather shop, Tandy Leather up in um, Hartford, Connecticut, and he would choose the biggest piece of leather hide that was that, you know, that the guy had. And then he would cut the biggest, you know, rectangular canvas that he could fit out of that large piece of hide. And then he would use the scraps for smaller pieces. Uh, you wanted anything to go to waste. So he would do some smaller pieces with the, the leftover parts. Um, but yes, yeah, some of them are really, really um, very Im impressive size. Um, and when you see them, you, you have a sense not only of their size, but also of the sculptural quality of the work because of all the texture of the tooling. They're really fascinating. Um, there are a couple of exhibits going on in New York City right now of his work. One at Fort Gansevoort and the other one at the Adelson Galleries. Um, and they have just wonderful examples of his work. Um, and to see them lined up and uh, to feel their power in the same room is, is just amazing. Thank you. Did your collaboration with them and the memories that that stirred up, did that produce additional artworks, inspire him to the new things? The, the painting of, that I showed you of the railroad tracks, you know, was the, was the product of that, uh, of, of some of the work that we were doing and uh, in, in telling the story about his feelings about his mother. And so it was just, it was really exciting when he finally was able to do that painting. Because as I told you, you know, when I when I did the reading, it was something that he didn't know if he'd be able to do, and it was just emotionally complicated for him. And he did other works of art in, in those two years as well. He, he created a bunch of different paintings of um, along the lines of some of the themes that I showed you. There were some some cotton fields and um, juke joints and portraits of people that he knew. So yeah, he was working up until the time of his death. He was pretty weak in the last few months and wasn't doing much art and was, I think, really focused on the book. There's a, uh, in the chat from Helen Sparrow, what is the reaction to him? <laughs> and then it stops with in. Um, in Georgia, both as an artist and as a former uh, as well, a former prisoner. He, he has had a couple of exhibitions in Georgia, um, which was very significant for him. Um, it was, uh, it felt like a victory to come back to Georgia as somebody important who had done something, you know, um, meaningful with his life and had made it, made a name for himself. Um, so that was just incredibly moving and he was very, very happy to go back home as he called it. Um, even though he hadn't been there for decades. Um, and the people that I've spoken to, I talked to a lot of people in his hometown, both friends and acquaintances, um, and some other people in town that didn't know him, um, but worked at the, co had worked at the college there. Um, and there's a, my sense is that there's a sense of pride of what he has accomplished, not only pride from the black community, but uh, but White's in, in Cuthbert too. I mean, I'm sure there's a range of different opinions about whether this story should be told and how they feel about the story. Um, but, but my sense was that there's some celebration of him in, in Georgia. Um, and we've been in touch with the Georgia Humanities um, Institute or Center in, in Georgia. They've been very excited about the book and promoting the book. Um, and the Carter Library invited us to do a program about the book um, in order to announce the book when it was first published. So we did that back in August or early September. Can't remember the exact date. Um, and that was very, very exciting and meaningful too. So, um, so you know, it, it was incredibly important to him to have his life story be considered part of the history of Georgia and of the South and as reminiscent and reflective of other people's experience as well. And um, I think he was hopeful that that would happen and I feel hopeful about it too. Nice. And 
Had he ever gone back to his hometown? Yes. He, for a long time, he didn't go back um, and was afraid to go back. And I think maybe went very quietly a couple of times. But after he became an artist, he did go back. Um, and as I mentioned, there was um, there were some exhibitions of his work in Georgia and there was one, there was a celebration of him in, in his hometown where the mayor handed the keys to the city to him and declared that it was going to be Winfred Rembert day to go down in <laughs> history. So he was celebrated by the mayor and other officials in the town. Um, and he was just very, always very excited to go back to Georgia and to reconnect with people there. Nice. Are there any other questions, comments? Well, this I, is Tom Spiro. We're wearing black here, but anyway, um, <laughs> my question, I have two questions. Uh, what happened when he finally met his first brother? What happened after that? And also, how did he get to Connecticut? So when he when he when he showed up at his birth mother's house, um, she didn't welcome him um, lovingly. She wasn't nice to him. Um, he did end up staying with her for a while, but her coldness toward him was um, a very painful thing for him, um, and that you know was one of the reasons why he was struggling so much with having, you know, her having relinquished him. I think he was hoping that she would be glad to see him and give him her love, but she didn't. So he didn't have a close, he never had a close relationship with her. He saw her a few times after that, um, but she, he, he felt that she never showed much love for him. So what he says at the end of the book, which I read, to you, it was, took, a, took a long time to come to the point where there was something he felt that he could interpret as her showing her love for him. In Connecticut, he he when he was released from prison, he is um, his great aunt Mama was really eager to get him out of Georgia, and they had some relatives in Rochester, New York, so they arranged for him to move up there. And he lived in Rochester for some time and then not long. And then eventually moved to Bridgeport, Connecticut, where there were some other family members. And he worked on the docks there um, for a while um, until he was injured. And, you know, it was just sort of scra scraping by for, for a long time. Um, and eventually settled with the family in New Haven, which is very close to Bridgeport. Thank you. Oops. Oh, I'm losing you. Yeah. Yeah. Oops. I think this is technical on my part. Huh. It's been really interesting to work on this project and to think about memoir and the significance of memoir and to kind of, you know, be be a part of this writing process with someone who's revisiting his past and kind of incorporating these memories into this personal narrative in a way that can allow a person, I think it did allow Winfred to dis discover some kind of new meaning in his, his own story. Um, so I'm very interested in sort of this way of achieving a sense of one's own personhood and meaningfulness in one's life through retelling of of an experience, and I, I of all these experiences from different different times in his life, and I think this um, the 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 constructing a self, you know, through this narrative retelling of of one's personal experiences was maybe especially important for somebody like Winfred, who you know suffered from trauma and also who had to do time in prison, which is really, you know, you lose time, you're, you're doing time as punishment. And so how do you sort of recover lost time um, into a sense of, you know, your life as a, as a whole when it's been so disrupted? So I just found it very interesting and powerful to think about those kinds of themes and to see the importance to him of being able to tell this story and you know, to express himself in this way. But I, I think 
just more broadly, you know, telling stories about our lives just allows us to kind of engage in reflection and think about our values and to just attain a sense of our own continuity over time. And it's, it's just a very, you know, a very powerful thing to do and to think about. Um, So I, I found that very illuminating. Did they have any children? They had eight children. Yes. Oh my they goodness. had many children, many <laughs> children. And they ended up with other kids from the neighborhood in their house. Um, they were an in- intact family, unlike some other families in their neighborhood. And um, when they found out that Winfred was, you know, this involved father and that there were all these kids in the house, they somehow acquired more. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, there were a lot of children in, in, in their lives and, they, you know, the kids are mostly all in the New Haven area now um, and supporting their mom and very involved. What a legacy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, one of Winfred's sons, went, Mitchell Rembert, um, learned some of these leather tooling skills and is developing himself as an artist. And one of the uh, exhibitions that I mentioned in New York that's going on right now is called Father and Son, and it shows oh. um, Winfred's work together with Mitchell's work, um, and it's it, it's just a great it's a great thing that's happening that's happening now. I think the exhibit is is still on, or, or maybe it just came down. But if you looked online at the Adelson Galleries, you could see some examples of Mitchell's work as well as Winfred's. So yes, the Rembrandt continues. Well, Aaron, I'm afraid we're, our time is up. Thank you so much. This has just been wonderful. And as I said earlier, it will be replayed on Sunday and follow, the following Wednesday at 7.30 uh, p.m. for anybody who missed any of it. Um, I, and I will you be around for a lo- uh, here at Horizon House for a little while if people run into you and have more questions? I'll be around this weekend. I'm leaving on to go back to Boston, Boston on Sunday. So, yeah, okay. maybe I'll Very run into some of you downstairs. Yes, hopefully we will. All right. Thank you again so much. Thank you Thank so you much for having much. me and yes. for listening. Thank I appreciate you. it.